Steve Levitsky and Dan Zibler. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. You guys have the best titles for books. The Tyranny of a Minority. It's another great title after How Democracies Die. You know, the founders worried about the tyranny of a majority. A lot of our institutions are meant to protect us against the tyranny of a majority. Why do you think today we should be worried about the tyranny of a minority? Well, we have a constitution which allows political minorities to govern majorities. Our constitution is a brilliant document. It was revolutionary at its time and was incredibly successful over a couple hundred centuries at generating wealth, prosperity, stability in the United States. But it's a pre democratic document that enables political minorities to systematically thwart and occasionally govern majorities. And as you know, Democrats across the world, including in the United States, have throughout history worked to make their democracies more democratic. And we think that in the United States, we've kind of stopped doing that work over the last half century or so. And we need to get back to that. We need to get back to empowering electoral majorities. Obviously, at the same time as we protect basics of liberties. I understand that this is also driven by a lot of concerns about sort of the contemporary American political scene, right? So as you framed it at the moment, it's a kind of 100-year conversation, but there's also a kind of five-year conversation that's part of it. Tell me a little bit more about how you argue that this tyranny of minority is empowering in particular uh, you know, the Republican Party and Donald Trump. Well, I think we all agree we're living through a real political crisis. We've had contested election in 2020. The four years before that were fraught. People are very fearful looking forward to 2024. And the idea really is that we can't understand this crisis we're in without understanding that this constitutional structure, combined with contemporary politics, has left us in a very precarious position. And so there's lots of things driving the radicalization of the Republican Party. But we think one major factor is that something ha has changed in the last 20 years or so. And in particular, what's changed really is that our Constitution has always favored rural areas, which represent a minority of the population. For most of our history, that really wasn't a big problem because both parties had urban and rural wings. But demographic changes have really led us to a position in the 21st century where the Republican Party is primarily the party of rural areas. Democrats are primarily the party of urban areas. And so this means that our constitutional structure overrepresents rural areas, in particular Repub the Republican Party. And so it's no longer necessary at the national level for the Republican Party to win majorities in order to uh, gain power. And so that has unleashed a set of distorting impacts on our politics that, that are very dangerous. And I want to come back to that point about what exactly caused this dominance of Republicans in rural areas and how to think about that from a constitutional perspective. But obviously, you also think that race plays an important piece in this picture. So how does race play into this argument that there's a kind of tyranny of a minority? Well, race has to do primarily with the radicalization of the Republican Party. It should be clear there are many reasons why the Republican Party radicalized over the last couple of decades, diverging views about it. But our central argument regarding why the Republican Party has sort of gone off the rails in the last 15 years or so is that in the latter third of the 20th century, the United States changed dramatically and the Republican Party did not. And it became an overwhelmingly white Christian party in a much more diverse country at around roughly the turn of the 21st century. And that brought two problems to the Republican Party. One is that it had a hard time competing for national majorities. Uh, it's lost the national popular vote in seven of the last eight elections because it was relying so heavily on white and particularly white Christian votes. And secondly, a segment of its base grew increasingly threatened. The Republican Party actually did an excellent job of appealing to racially conservative whites over the course of the last third of the 20th century, those who were unhappy with movement towards particularly government efforts to enforce civil rights in the last part of the 20th century. The Republican Party recruited these folks into its party and became a more racially conservative party. A primary winning plurality of the Republican base grew pretty resentful over the very visible rise of multiracial democracy in the 21st century. So the party radicalized. Great. So I think that lays out some of the core argument in the book. There's obviously a lot more subtlety to it. 
as readers of yours have become accustomed, there's a lot of very interesting historical parallels and stories from around the world and from the past of democratic institutions in the United States and beyond. And I think that there's important parts of the argument that I agree with, but I think illuminate a lot of what's going on at the moment. In the spirit of good academic debate, I want to focus a lot of the conversation on some of the things where we have disagreements and try and sort of tease those out and look into those. I mean, the first sort of obvious critique, which I don't think is the heart of my critique, but is an important question to ask is, you know, isn't the existence of multiple veto points and multiple veto powers precisely one of the things that is going to constrain political power? So perhaps it helps to explain in a certain kind of way how somebody who doesn't have a popular majority around the country becomes president. But, you know, aren't a lot of those same institutions also helpful in explaining why somebody like Donald Trump has not been able to consolidate power while he was in office, unlike many other authoritarian populists that we've seen in the world? And isn't the founders' fear about the tyranny of a majority one of the things that has allowed those institutions to persist over centuries, even though they've often led to frustration, they've often led to a lack of reform, they've often made America less nimble. But when you look at America's performance over 250 years and the longevity of these institutions, perhaps that actually is a price worth paying. So are we sort of, you know, zooming in here on the costs of those institutions while abstracting away the value that those institutions have proven to have over 250 years? I agree with you that our system of checks and balances did constrain Donald Trump, but particular federalism is something that I think people didn't fully appreciate, the role of federalism and all of them and so on. Our point really, though, is that democracy consists of two main pillars. One, the ability for a collectivity to determine its own fate, and two, the protection of individual rights. And so another way to put it is democracy is more than majority rule, but without majority rule, there is no democracy. And so the question of how to balance these two is, of course, the heart of the battle. And so what we're arguing is that what we really believe, looking at the American situation, is that whereas it's, it's certainly necessary to protect individual liberties and individual rights and minority rights, and that's why we have the Bill of Rights, that's why we have an independent judiciary On the other hand, democracy also requires that the majority in particular has the ability in two domains to govern. Number one, that the person who wins the most votes should be able to govern. That's a basic democratic principle that's hard to justify. It's hard to think of any democratic theory that would uh, offer an alternative uh, to that. The person who wins the most votes should govern, so in the domain of elections. And the second domain is when a party has a majority in a legislature, the, the party with that majority should be able to legislate and pass laws, provided it's not violating the civil liberties and entrenching itself in power, so violating basic democratic principles. So these are two sort of key carve-outs, in a sense, where majorities should govern. And so there was a famous Supreme Court decision where the argument was made that, you know, uh, certain things should be beyond the reach of majorities. Um, And that's absolutely right. You know, basic civil liberties, freedom of press, freedom of association, freedom of religion, free democratic competition, the ability of an opposition to organize, these things should be beyond the reach of majorities. On the other hand, what we sometimes forget in the American setting is that certain things should be within the reach of majorities. And again, particular, the right to form governments and the right to govern with those majorities. First of all, we are not advocating for a radical overhaul of the Constitution. We completely agree with you that America's core democratic institutions are very robust and very important. So we are not advocating to eliminate bicameralism. We're not advocating to eliminate federalism. We're not advocating to eliminate, obviously, the Bill of Rights, nor an independent Supreme Court with judicial review power. So all of those important counter-majoritarian institutions, we argue, should remain in place. The whole set of reforms that we propose in the final chapter of our book would basically put us more in line with European democracies. And there is quite a bit of evidence that a slightly more majoritarian democratic system along the lines of Denmark and New Zealand and Finland is not necessarily a threat to democracy. Just a final point, I wouldn't overstate the degree to which our constitutional framers designed our institutions with the intent of preventing tyranny of the majority. Both Hamilton and Madison strongly opposed the current structure of the Senate in which each state gets equal representation. That was designed because small states insisted on it and threatened even to break up the union if they didn't get it. That was not part of some sort of farsighted 
design of our founders. Madison opposed the Electoral College. The Electoral College was not sort of some far-sighted counter-majoritarian institution. It was the second best solution after other alternatives had been voted down in the convention. And both Hamilton and Madison opposed supermajority rules for regular legislation, what is now known as the filibuster. Filibuster is not in the Constitution. The filibuster wasn't part of the original design of the, of the Senate. But coming out of the experience of the Articles of Confederation and looking at what was going on in Poland in the late 18th century, Hamilton in particular, but also Madison, were very concerned about supermajority rules for regular legislation in the Congress. So the kinds of excessively counter-majoritarian institutions that we're calling for the reform of were not part of some constitutional design aimed at combating tyranny of the majority and don't exist in most other established democracies. Yeah, and I think one of the points where I agree with you is that the United States, on many counts, now has more veto points than just about any other democratic country in the world. And, you know, there's an interesting literature that Steve, you know, a lot better than I do, centered mostly on Latin America that shows that, paradoxically, when you can't get anything done, when you can't get anything passed, that should be a protection against the tyranny of a majority. And in many contexts it is, but when citizens become so frustrated at the inability to do anything, that in fact that inspires the election of a strongman who says, look, I'm going to do away with all of this ordinary politics, which is clearly dysfunctional. You just have to trust me to, to do better than that. And so paradoxically, having too many roadblocks in the way of the majority sort of translating their views into policy can weaken rather than strengthen democracies in many contexts and as a debate about exactly when and how that is the case. That seems plausible to me. And so I too am somewhat concerned about those elements of the American state. I guess I have questions about two things, one of which is, just to telegraph where I'm going to go, one of which is sort of a basic narrative of what's happened to American politics and how we should understand this political moment and whether the nature of it is sort of a tyranny of a minority. And then the second is sort of how we relate to it as academics and what actually is likely to get us through this moment. So I think that's a good bit of what we'll discuss. And at the end, I do want to have a chance to really talk about sort of some of your prescriptions as well. So I guess there's a narrative of this moment, which broadly speaking says that Republicans represent a declining part of the American electorate, which is mostly based around white voters. And because of these institutions, as well as because of practices like voter suppression, they are able to perpetuate their political power. And that is really the fundamental problem. So the fundamental problem is with the rule of a minority and the kind of structural obstacles to the majority expressing itself. And again, I think there's an element of truth to that. But I worry about the ways in which that narrative makes it harder for us to understand what's happening. Right. So one of them in particular is on the demographic level. I'm struck by the fact that the American electorate has significantly racially depolarized since 2016. So in 2016, knowing whether you're white or whether you're a quote unquote person of color gave you much more information about who you were likely to vote for than it did in 2020. And it gave you more information in 2020 than it does in recent polls. In fact, according to many recent polls, the gap, particularly among non-college voters, and especially among non-college, non-white men, has just plummeted. And we see that in places like Florida, which we might have expected to become you know, strongly democratic-leaning as they diversified. There was certainly the assumption of democratic strategists for much of the early 2010s. And instead, those states have become quite solidly Republican, even as they've diversified. Not because of voter suppression, but because of in the main, because of the ability of Republicans to appeal to them. So I guess one question I have is sort of how does the narrative of a tyranny of minority and the narrative of how race plays into that square with what seems to actually be surprisingly and shockingly a quite effective ability by the Trumpified Republican Party to appeal to a growing share of non-white voters. So, yeah, I, in some sense, really agree with what you're just saying. So my vision, and I think Steve's vision as well, of a successful coping with this problem that we're talking about, and our great sign of success would, in fact, be if the Republican Party could win the presidency with a popular vote, win the Senate with a popular majority, win the House of Representatives with a popular majority. This would be a great day for America if the Republican Party could win power with majorities fair and square. 
because what this would mean to me is the party is able to reach out to broad, diverse segments of the American electorate. And if it were able to do that, then we'd have two parties that are committed to the democratic rules of the game, competing in democracy. Is, this is essential for democracy to survive, is to have at least two political parties competing for uh, segments of the electorate. So if we can move in that direction, I think that would be a great sign of success. And that's sort of where our prescriptions in our book hope to get us. The account that we provide of how we ended up in this moment is, again, exactly as you described, them, I mean, highly racially polarized political parties up until... 2016. And I think in in many ways, as Steve described, the radicalization of the Republican Party has been driven by that racial division. American Republican Party has predominantly been a party of overwhelmingly white Christians through the 1980s, 1990s, up until very recently. So what our account is, is really a kind of how we got here. The way we get out is exactly as you're describing, that the party can reach out. So the question is, how does the Republican Party get to that place where it can be a multi-ethnic party? because our democracy survives on. And that's what our proposals are, an effort to kind of jumpstart that process. And I guess the concern is partly that we're not there, that there may be a ceiling to what the Republican Party is able to do if it doesn't reform itself. You know, And so it's true that you know through the first part of the 21st century, the Democratic Party, 90% of African Americans voted for the Democratic Party in national presidential elections. In 2020, that number dropped to like 87%. So the African-American vote oh, still overwhelmingly votes for the Democratic Party. Latinos as well, I mean, obviously lower numbers voting for Democrats, but still majorities of Latinos vote for the Democratic Party. And so, you know, it's important not to overstate the amount of change that has happened. But again, at the end of the day, that this is what's required in a multi-ethnic democracy is the political parties are not divided on ethnic lines. And Yasha, the problem with our institutions is not so much that a white dominated Republican Party is imposing itself on the majority, although that is happening in the Senate and occasionally happens in the Electoral College. Our greatest concern is that the rural bias of our institutions, as Daniel mentioned a couple of minutes ago, weakens the incentive of the Republican Party to broaden its appeal. And, you know, what you say about Florida is absolutely right. That's not representative of the country. The Latino vote in Florida is a very strange brew of Cuban-Americans and other exiles from leftist dictatorships in in Latin America. So there's a sort of leftism among the Latino vote in, in Florida that you don't see as pronounced elsewhere. But I think we can agree that no matter what the Latino vote for the Republican Party right now, this is not a party that is hell-bent on broadening its appeal. As Daniel pointed out, the success or reconsolidation of American democracy will occur when both parties are multiracial, both parties are equally capable of winning comfortable majorities in this country. And to get there, the Republican Party needs to become much more diverse. It needs to make a broader appeal. And notwithstanding Florida... I think we can all agree the Republican Party is not working hard to broaden its appeal. It has largely doubled down on its core constituents. Well, actually, I think that's where we disagree. So two points. The first is that I do think it goes well beyond Florida, right? So we saw, for example, you know, in an important election to the House of Representatives, a district in the south of Texas, which is overwhelmingly Latino, vote Republican for the first time. Oh, of course. I mean, let's not be too simplistic, Yasha. Who are voters in south of Texas, right? They are rural. They are non-college educated. They're church growing and they're probably gun owning. So we shouldn't be shocked. You know, so they should vote Republican. I mean, sure, but that indicates that it goes, you know, again, this is an overwhelmingly non-white district and it's outside of Florida. So I'm just saying it goes beyond that. In one recent poll... Nationally, the vote is still close to two to one Latino voting Democrat, right? So let's not overstate the case. But the trends are rapidly going the other direction. So in one recent poll, Biden beats Trump among non-white, non-college voters by 49 to 33, which is a significant margin, but it's much, much narrower than anybody would have predicted five or six years ago. So here's, look, what we agree about is that Trump is a political threat. What we also agree about is that it would be a very, very good thing for the Republican Party to become a party respectful of American democratic institutions and traditions and much more multiracial, right? I think perhaps I am more skeptical about whether those goals pull in the same direction or not than you are, which is to say that in the book, and you sort of refer to it implicitly in this conversation, you have nostalgia for this moment when Reigns Priebus 
presents the sort of post-mortem of why Republicans lost to Barack Obama in 2012 and argues that Republicans need to become more politically moderate and need to embrace immigration reform in order to gain votes among non-white voters and become compatible with them. And that's a political vision I'm very sympathetic to. I wish that the Republican Party had gone that way and I wish that that had worked out. The Republican Party went in the opposite direction and yet I think it has actually very effectively diversified. If you looked at the 2020 RNC convention, it had a huge variety of voices in class terms, but also in ethnic terms. When you look at the people who are on the debate stage at the sort of kids' table outside of Donald Trump, there's a lot of non-white candidates there, and we're seeing that rise in support. So I guess what I'm wondering about is whether we, with our preferences that we share, have trouble seeing how elements of that working class, populist, angry at the institutions, angry at the establishment rhetoric, and perhaps even parts of anti-immigrant rhetoric can appeal to a lot of non-white voters, can appeal even to a lot of Latino voters who have been in this country for a long time. So here's where I wonder whether the goal of getting a Republican Party that is more institutionally moderate and the hope for a Republican Party that is more diverse don't go hand in hand with each other as naturally as all of us would wish or as perhaps we assume. So look, I mean, what we are interested in is a political party that is committed to democracy. We want two political parties that are committed to democracy. What that means is very simply, in all political systems, is the case. Number one, that a political party accepts the results of elections, win or lose. Number two, that they don't engage in political violence in order to gain and to hold on to power. Number three, and this is a little more complicated, if you're a political party or a political leader, you distance yourself from your allies who engage in either of those two first behaviors. Now, what's very clear is that there's some political leaders and a political party in the United States that has more directly violated that basic principle than the other. And so look at the January 6th assault and the reaction to the January 6th assault, and it's pretty clear the Republican Party couldn't win a national majority, couldn't win a national majority in 2016 for the presidency, has only won a national majority for the presidency one time since 1988. So I would contend that the party is not very effective at reaching out. I mean, at the margins, sure, you can point to these kind of, you know, three percentage changes. But if the party were, in fact, able to win national majorities, it wouldn't have to storm the Capitol in order to try to hold on to power. And so the point here is, how do you win power? You win power in a democracy. You ought to be able to win power in a, in a democracy by winning majorities. The Republican Party at the national level is not able to do that. If it had a more diverse base, and sure, we can point to some positive trends, but these are trends at the margins. If it could reach out to a broader base, if it had the incentives to reach out to a broader base, then it wouldn't have to try to overthrow elections and we'd be in a much better position. So I think that's our basic position. So I agree with those goals. And I think one of the really interesting and convincing parts of your book is describing sort of the basic democratic orientations that political parties have to have to be responsible players in a democracy, including the ways in which they have to stand up to anti-democratic extremists within their own ranks. So that is the goal. I think it is easy for to assume that two things go together here. That on one hand, you have a, a politically more moderate Republican Party that is more open to immigration, that is less likely to have these kind of extremist appeals, that is more respectful of democratic institutions, and that through implied causality, in part because of that, is going to be better at attracting non-white voters, at broadening its base beyond its traditional sort of constituency of you know, white Christian voters. And on the other hand, you're going to have the sort of MAGA Republican Party that is an irresponsible political player, that is a threat to these democratic institutions, and that as a result of that is going to struggle to attract those kinds of voters that go beyond its traditional base. And I guess I'm wondering whether the story of the last eight years, which I did not predict and nobody really predicted, I don't think Donald Trump predicted it, I don't think it was a conscious strategy, has shown us that the story is more complicated and that in fact and I want to come back in a bit to sort of what the Democratic Party has done, the other side of the coin in a two-party system, but that in fact, Donald Trump has realized Reigns Priebus's dream. I think if Reigns Priebus in 2012 had seen the number of voters 
that Republicans can now attract beyond this traditional base, you would say, we've done exactly what I wanted, except that it's happened through this very, very different path. Yasha, when's the last time the Republicans won the popular vote in a national election outside of a midterm where they're in opposition? Well, so, so they did win it in, in 2022 in the midterm. Yeah, but the opposition always wins because their turnout is higher in a midterm election. What's the evidence that their Republicans are now, post-Trump, able to win national popular majorities? So here we're assuming that we have changed political institutions, and I know that you're arguing for that, but we all know that you know that's going to be a long struggle, and at least in the short run, we have to operate outside of that. The point is that the Republican Party has, in fact, been able to broaden its demographic base much more than we expected in 2012 and definitely much more than we expected in 2016. Now, I agree they continue to fall short of a majority, and that's in part because Donald Trump is a very, very irresponsible politician who, while he has strong appeal to part of the population, is deeply unpopular across most demographic groups in the United States. So again, I'm pushing for this. I mean, I hope that you, what you're saying is right. The problem is, I, this is not Rance Priebus's dream. This is Rance Priebus's nightmare. The Republican Party hasn't won a popular vote for the presidency since he came up with that strategy. And so, in other words, you know, you're right that there's some movement, but let's keep this in the broad sweep of history here. I mean, the Republican Party, 87% of African Americans vote for the Democratic Party. of Latinos vote for the Democratic Party. So, you know, if that's success, then we can go home and stop worrying. I think, I mean, that's just, that's not right. I mean, I think, you know, again, we agree that that's the goal, but the question is, how do you get there? And I think, I don't think we're there as evidence. And, you know, you could say there, how do we decide if a party is successful or not? We decide if a party is successful or not based on whether it wins elections or whether it's able to win majorities. And it's not able to win majorities. And so on our question, again, remember, is like, why is our democracy in trouble? And our democracy is in trouble because the Republican Party can't win majorities. Yeah, I was just speculating, and this is speculation, so neither of us can say this with certainty, but he's speculating that the Republic, there's a world that hasn't happened yet, let's be clear. But there's a world in which the Republicans under, say, Vivek can win majorities that include a larger number of non-white voters and still be authoritarian. That we're sort of juxtaposing a Democratic Republican Party with a MAGA one. And you're right. You have to have a theory of authoritarian. So we're asking the question, why, after 150 years, has a mainstream center-right party gone berserk, gone off the rails, not accepted the results of an election, not been willing to impeach and convict a president who incited an insurrection, not been willing to investigate and hold accountable those responsible for an insurrection aimed at overturning an election. Why is the Republican Party turned authoritarian? You need a theory for that. Our theory focuses on the perception of existential threat faced by some members of a once dominant ethnic majority that's losing its dominant status. So our theory is that if you're right and the rest of the country becomes Florida and as a small D Democrat, I hope this happens, the Republicans build a multiracial base and are able to win popular majorities comfortably again, as they were, say, in the 1980s. If that's right, our theory is that the party would moderate politically. I'm not talking about immigration. I'm talking about towards democratic institutions. The party would re-democratize, would again play by democratic rules because it doesn't face the same electoral or existential threat that it faces now. That is our theory of the party's authoritarianism. What's your theory for why a multiracial Republican party that could win elections would nevertheless be authoritarian? Well, so let's distinguish between the causal explanation of why and the observation that that can happen in many contexts. So, you know, we're uh, all comparativists. Dan and Steve, you're sort of more fully paid up comparativists than I am. I started off as a political theorist. But we tend to think that in order to explain outcomes, it's helpful to look at many different countries and cases. And that's something you do in the book in many illuminating ways. But, you know, when you think about Donald Trump as being an authoritarian populist, which I think, broadly speaking, we're agreed on, perhaps of different kind of interpretations exactly of what that means and implies, then you can look at the cases of other four-time populists around the world. And we see, in fact, that in many countries, including Poland and India and Turkey, there have been four-time populists in the last years that don't face similar demographic transformations, whose populations continue to be overwhelmingly of the same demographic group in the cases of Poland and Turkey, or sort of relatively stably a majority for the ruling group in India, where there's a more significant minority population, but one that hasn't really changed particularly strongly in terms of its relative portion of the population. 
And we've seen authoritarian populist political parties um, uh, undermine democratic institutions in very extreme ways in those cases as well. So the next question then is, okay, how do we explain that? And we can have a long conversation debate about that. But I think it's certainly quite plausible to think that parties can be driven towards that anti-democratic behavior absent the condition of that kind of demographic threat. Okay, that's not a theory about why the Republican Party would become authoritarian, but let's move on. No, but Steve, you're saying the only plausible reason is that kind of demographic threat. And I'm giving you contemporary cases outside of the United States in which you see very similar behavior absent the causal factor that you impute. And so surely that shows that you at least need to acknowledge that there's other potential explanations. I think you're absolutely right, Yasha, that there's multiple reasons. You know, there's things we haven't talked about much, you know, social media, economic inequality. There's all sorts of things that might drive parties to radicalize, even in the United States, elsewhere. Perception of demographic threat is certainly one as well. That's what we are emphasizing. But at the end of the day, really, our punchline is that our institutions are making this transition more difficult in the United States. And that's why our book's entitled Tyranny of the Minority. It's that our institutions have distorted this transition process. And in principle, the idea of looking at our institutions and how they shape how political leaders behave is sort of the main point that we're trying to make. And what this leads us to, the point that, you know, we need to get back to the work of democratizing our democracy. I mean, that's where we've fallen down on the job. And this is this kind of radical experiment that we're engaged in. I mean, there's a great American tradition of reforming our constitution. We're doing the work to make our democracy more democratic after the Civil War, the progressive era. And what's radical now is that we are engaged in a radical experiment of non-improving of our democracy. And over the last 50 years, we have essentially given this up. And, you know, our idea is that we need to get back to this great American tradition. We're operating outside of the American tradition. We're operating outside of the tradition of other stable democracies. Let's compare the United States, not to Turkey and Poland and to India, but to Sweden, to Norway, to Denmark, to Germany. And when we do that, where we are a real outlier is in our unwillingness or inability ability to make our system more democratic. And so I think that's really the heart of our book in a way. Let's flip the coin for a moment and look at the Democratic Party, which obviously, in a sense, is of less concern because it continues to accept the basic institutions of our democracy. But of course, one way of framing this political moment is to say that the Democratic Party keeps winning narrow popular majorities and because of the institutions, it doesn't get to govern. And I agree that that is a problem. Another way to frame it is that in 2016, when Donald Trump ran and then won the Republican Party nomination, we thought he would be wiped out, right? We thought that it would be a 60-40 or 65-35 kind of outcome. That's what a lot of people were predicting at the time. And it ended up being much more narrow than that. Even now, as Donald Trump has been indicted in a number of different court processes and so on, he's running close to head to head with Joe Biden in polls. In some polls, he's in fact ahead and so on. On average, he seems to be lying, uh, running something like two or three points behind as we're recording. And so there's a question about why the Democratic Party has not been able to open up a broader lead under those kind of extraordinary circumstances, right? Now, I was struck at one point, you say about the Republicans in California, astutely and rightly, that the GOP's fate in California, where it used to be competitive and uh, obviously no longer is, was not inevitable. Becoming the representative of a declining white Christian majority was a political choice. Such as attempting, they offer considerable short-term rewards, but as California shows, they can eventually be disastrous. I guess I was wondering, one of the big transformations over the last years is that the Democratic Party has more and more become the party, not of a particular demographic group in ethnic terms, but in educational terms, that it has hugely improved its share of the vote among educated voters, but significantly lost standing among non-college voters, particularly white non-college voters, but also non-white non-college voters. And I guess one question I have is, is that a choice that is tempting for the Democratic Party, but that is dangerous in similar ways? Is there a concern that in order to force the Republicans to the negotiating table, in order to moderate the Republican Party, Democrats have to be able to broaden their electoral appeal, especially among non-educated voters. I thought a little bit about the joke, you know, about Adlai Stevenson, that some voter, when he was campaigning, said, you have every thinking man's vote. 
Natalie Stevenson, I assume was apocryphal, perhaps it's true, responded, yes, but unfortunately there's not enough of those to win a majority. Are Democrats now pursuing the Adlai Stevenson strategy in a way that should concern us in intellectual terms? Not in terms of a direct impact on democratic institutions, but in terms of their ability to win such commanding majorities that would force the Republicans back to the negotiating table in the kind of way that we're hoping to moderate the party. I mean, that's a big ask of the Democrats to win overwhelming majorities to force the Republicans to the negotiating table to save our democracy. The Democrats are a political party. They're a distinctive political party in that they're an extraordinarily heterogeneous. I mean, you could say all you want about the increase in the college educated voters, but the Democratic Party electorate is extraordinarily diverse and it's full of very distinct and often conflicting constituencies. So the party is kind of a messy, pragmatic, slow-moving party, inevitably, invariably, and pretty consistently. That has strengths and it has weaknesses. One of the great strengths is the party is less likely, not possible, just less likely, I think, to radicalize or to assault democracy. But it makes it very, very difficult for the party to move quickly, to move nimbly, and to pursue the strategies that social scientists want them to pursue. The party has won the popular vote for the presidential election in every election since I was in college. It takes three elections to complete a full renovation of the Senate, right? It takes a six-year cycle to fully elect the Senate. Every six-year cycle, 1996 to 2000, the Democrats have won a majority of the popular vote for the Senate for a generation. Sure, there are lots of things that the Democrats could potentially be doing better, but they're winning popular majorities consistently. And that's what political parties are supposed to do. As I'm th- sitting here thinking about it, I'm trying to think, is in the democratic world, is there a political party that is actually more diverse than the democratic party of the United States? I mean, because of our two-party system, number one, I mean, any other multi-party system, you know, you're going to have lots of parties that have really sort of targeted constituencies, First of all, we have a two-party system, so we have these two giant parties that have to encompass this incredibly diverse country of 300 million people across vast territory. That's how our system is supposed to work, and the Democratic Party is living up to that. I mean, I, I try to think of you know another democracy in the world where you have a political party that has as diverse a constituency. So when we ask, is it diverse enough, I guess compared to what? I mean, we could imagine that it should be more diverse, but I think it's a remarkably diverse and, in terms of winning the popular vote, effective entity. And that's why, you know, we come back. The point is, our institutions don't allow that majority to speak. And that's why we end up landing on that as the kind of key barrier. So to be clear, I wasn't claiming the Democratic Party is not diverse, but I was claiming that it has traded off a significant gain among educated voters for significant losses among less educated voters. And, you know, there's two ways of thinking about this, right? Like one is that We know what the rules of the game have been for 250 years, and political parties need to maximize their ability to win and rule by those rules of the game. And the other is to say that we should change the rules of the game. Those two things need not be mutually exclusive, right? It can be both. You can both aim for, say, certain changes of the rules of the game that are democratically legitimate, pursue them in democratically legitimate ways, and try to win the elections that allow you to do that, right? So I'm not saying these are mutually exclusive strategies, but I guess I do wonder, you know, and we'll come to some of the suggestions you have for reform. Many of them I agree with. I agree that there's no deep justification in the Electoral College. I agree that the filibuster is not a deeply legitimate institution. I'm a little more skeptical about whether, in a partisan sense, it would help Democrats or it would help Democratic priorities to abolish the filibuster, but that's not why you're arguing for it. I recognize that. So a lot of the people who are activists for abolishing the filibuster. I view critically because I think they're naive about what the impact of it is going to be. But I certainly don't think that the filibuster is some great hallowed institutions that we must at all costs protect. I guess I am a little bit more skeptical about the the suggestion to reform the Senate in a deep way. and, And perhaps we can come to that a little bit. But the fundamental question as to why Democrats aren't able to win a majority in the Senate is you can say, look, the Senate is a counter-majoritarian institution, and that makes it in some straightforward ways unjust, and and I buy that point. But you can also say, look, in 2008, Barack Obama was able to win in the Senate, I believe, in states like Indiana, in Ohio, and other places. He won states in the presidential race, including Indiana and all kinds of places that today would be seen as being sort of outside the reach of Democrats. The Dems in the 2008 Senate election picked up 
Alaska and they held seats in Montana and South Dakota and Louisiana and Arkansas and so on, right? And so there is a kind of question, well, strategically today, we're trying to figure out how do we beat the danger to democracy from a four-time populist like Donald Trump. One kind of strategy is let's try to change the Senate, which as we know, for other kind of counter-majoritarian reasons, is incredibly hard to do. The other is, well, perhaps Democrats need to think about how they can be competitive in some of those states, right? Like, yes, it's a high bar. We can be upset about the fact that it's a high bar. We can criticize it. But perhaps Democrats actually need to think more carefully about how do we actually build that governing majority in the Senate, given that those are the rules of the game. We can also have as a plank, let's change the Senate. But since we know, and I think you agree, that's not about to happen tomorrow. It's not about to happen in the lifetime of a threat of authoritarian populism from the right, you know, perhaps Democrats nationwide for the Senate, like you're telling Republicans in California, need to change who they're appealing to. I have no disagreement with the idea that the Democrats, from a partisan point of view, should win in places where they haven't been able to win in the past. There's nothing to disagree with there. The question, though, for us that we're interested in our book is how do we save our democracy? And and the, the kind of hierarchy of causes of or the hierarchy of things that we need to address, it seems to me, you know, Democrats winning in Ohio and Indiana is not at the top of the list. We could just have the Democrats win every election and with overwhelming majorities. You know, that's maybe necessary to get through the momentary crisis. That's certainly true. But to have a viable democracy for the long haul. We need two political parties that can compete for majorities. And so to the degree that both of them can do that, that's great. And so that's why I applaud all efforts for Democrats to reach out to new areas as well as Republicans. And we need to have hard-fought elections. My sense, though, is that given that it's the Republican Party that has stood by as the Congress is assaulted in January 6 and refused to investigate, that's where the real threat is. Sure, what you're describing is fine, but I just don't think that that's the center of the action. And take a step back and think about the question that we're asking the problem isn't so much the, the Democrats' inability to win Ohio as it is the fact that we have to worry so much about the Democrats' ability to win Ohio, right? I'm a member of the Democratic Party. We should be in a, in a world in which I'm bummed out that the Democrats lose control of the Senate, but we're not worried for the survival of our democracy. The question that we're debating is whether the Democratic Party can find the correct strategy not just to win the election – but to fend off authoritarianism. And that points to the problem that our book is focused on. I agree. I guess the argument I'm making is that the most immediate way to save our democracy is for Democrats to win significant majorities with the institutions we have. And in part, they will have to do that because unless you imagine the current Republican Party being willing to adopt some of those institutional reforms in the greater good of our long-run democracy, it will take either crushing majorities for Democrats or significant majorities for Democrats and the ensuing moderation of a Republican Party that realizes it can't compete on its current ideological platform for us to get through those reforms, right? So how are we going to get through those reforms? We don't disagree with you at all, but we're not democratic strategists. We're political scientists, and our comparative advantage is taking a step back and pointing to some of the deeper issues. We don't disagree with you at all. So in terms of the reforms to our institutions, I think here's something where we agree on many of them. We might disagree on a couple of them, but I'll try to get to. What should we do? If it was not so difficult to change these institutions or if there came an extraordinary political moment where there's real bipartisan support for institutional renovation, what should be top of that priority list? What kind of changes should we in fact make to set up our institutions in a more lasting way to evade the problem you described? I would just like to say the core principle here, and it's really important to make this point, is that our reform ideas are not about saving the Democratic Party, and our goals are not partisan, because it's not partisan to think that the party who wins the most votes for the presidency should govern. I mean, the Electoral College, for example, throughout history has sometimes benefited Democrats, sometimes benefited Republicans. The broader point is that it's unfair. And so what our proposals are about are ways of making our democratic system more fair and taking up this challenge that has happened, you know, that we've addressed in the past in America of trying to make our system more democratic. Now, the kind of domains that we talk about, the Electoral College, the Senate, the filibuster, and so on, these things we've referred to already a little bit here, are also drawing on experiences of other countries. 
other countries around the world have eliminated upper chambers or they've made upper chambers, let's say in Germany, more proportional to population. They've introduced electoral reforms. You know, so today we are in a situation, just to give two examples, where we're the only presidential democracy in the world with an electoral college. Other countries had this, they got rid of it. We still have it. These other countries got rid of it. You know, democracy hasn't collapsed. We're the only democracy in the world without term limits or retirement ages for Supreme Court justices. The only democracy in the world. Other democracies used to not have term limits and retirement ages. They got rid of them. People may have been scared at the moment that this happened because people are afraid of change. These democracies didn't collapse. So the motivation really is to say, you know, look at this. This works in other places, and some of these things can work here, and they're justifiable from a kind of fairness perspective because they allow majorities to speak. And then more broadly, though, they will have this effect, we suspect, of pushing the Republican Party in the directions that we've been talking about. And so that's the kind of broad background. So we have a list of 15 proposals We're not going to go through all 15 with you. You know, people can look at that in the book. But, you know, just to give one, like one that's not a constitutional reform, but that is institutional. We've talked about the filibuster. We are also the only country in the world with such a strong filibuster that blocks debate in the second chamber. You know, this doesn't require constitutional reform, as any of your listeners will know. It just requires a change in the Senate rules. This is not something that was written in stone to begin with from the founding. The number has fluctuated as late as the 1970s. It was reduced. You know, so in other words, a, a majority can't simply pass a bill in the Senate, that you need to actually have 60 votes in order to pass a bill. And so, you know, there's all sorts of ideas. One could eliminate, that's what we call for, eliminate it outright. I mean, the Senate has actually discussed this. One could simply lower the threshold, maybe can make it 52. One could require Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of thing where you have to actually be on the Senate floor. But there's really no justifiable reason to have this 60 vote requirement. And it's blocking major kinds of policy. And this is where policy does matter. I mean, we're really talking about procedures, but policy does matter because, you know, there are a lot of people who are extremely frustrated about guns in the United States, about climate change. You know, there's a whole range of issues and this legislation gets blocked in the Senate. And I think to build a kind of momentum for these other arenas of institutional change, I think we need to have some success. So that's one area to begin. And it's kind of relatively low hanging fruit. It doesn't require the approval of the states and so on. Now, one counter argument to this, I should say, is that people say, and we kind of implied in your very first question, I think that, well, we maybe we're going to need the filibuster. And if Donald Trump comes back to power, you know, if we get rid of it, you know, we'll be really in bad shape. I mean, there's two responses to that. One, you know, I think there's very high odds that if, you know, Republicans retake the presidency and the Senate, that they would try to get rid of the filibuster. So it's sort of something that has lost a lot of legitimacy to begin with. Number two, to fail to act out of this incredible fear is like one way to go. But another way to go is to kind of act with a lot of hope and to think of all the great things we can pass. If we get rid of the filibuster, you know, there may be a risk to that, but I think, or make it weaker. But we have to trust voters to punish politicians for overreaching. If politicians overreach, they'll be thrown out of office. I mean, that's the way our democracy should work. Just to talk about the filibuster, but there's others. Maybe Steve wants to pick up some of the other reforms. Some really straightforward, not easy, but straightforward reforms. As we discussed earlier, we advocate for replacing the Electoral College with direct presidential elections. We advocate for a constitutional right to vote that exists in most democracies in the world. Americans are sometimes surprised to hear that they don't have a universal constitutional right to vote. I think that would help us fend off these politicized discussions over laws that arguably are aimed at voter suppression in certain states and other measures, non-constitutional measures, to make it easier to encourage voting, so automatic registration, possibly moving election day, either to make it a national holiday or moving it to a Sunday, as in most democracies, just a series of steps in which the government not only doesn't put up obstacles, but encourages and facilitates voting so that rather than you know, 57 or 60 percent on a good election of Americans voting, we get up in the range of 75 or 80 percent of Americans voting in elections. We also, as Daniel mentioned, call for term limits on Supreme Court justices, either 12 or 18 year terms, in addition to combating what we call intergenerational counter-majoritarianism. That would help to, and this is really critical, depoliticize and sort of lower the temperature in the judicial appointment process. I mean, we've gotten to the point where just about every Supreme Court vacancy creates a political and potentially even constitutional crisis. And regular rotation on and off the Supreme Court in which every president knows that she or he is going to have two, maybe three appointments during a term 
will dramatically lower the temperature in the appointment process. So that seems like a pretty straightforward reform. So again, I think that we do have many agreements and it's just always more fun to talk about the disagreements. I think, you know, broadly speaking, all of the reforms you've listed in one form or another, I would be on board with. I do have a question about your proposal to change the composition of the Senate. The case for how it's counter-majoritarian and how, from one democratic perspective, that is a concern for worry is relatively obvious. The difference between the number of voters in North Dakota who get two senators and the number of voters in California or Texas or New York who also get two voters is very, very large. And in one sense, we of course have a principle of one person, one vote, that we want each citizen to have roughly the same weight over our legislation. On the other hand, there are counter-majoritarian elements in virtually every federal system. There is a strong counter-majoritarian element to upper chambers in federal countries in many countries. And at the most extreme level, perhaps in the European Union, where, you know, the country of Luxembourg has one vote on many issues alongside the country of Germany or France. In some other contexts, there's a qualified majority voting where you're counting the size of states differently, but in some contexts it really is by state and in some contexts it has to be even unanimous, right? And here there's something where, as you described very well in the book, there was a racial element to how those debates played out, but the strongest argument for why the Senate has this equal representation of states was one that pitted small states in both the North and the South against large states in both the North and the South. So this was not a coalition of slaveholding versus non-slaveholding states. It was a coalition that split slaveholding and non-slaveholding states in significant respects at the founding. So here, I guess I have a question. It's true that certainly what it means to be a Delawarean or what it means to be a Rhode Islander or what it means to be a North Dakotan, I guess North Dakota did not yet exist, is perhaps less strong today than it was in 1800. And perhaps we can say we're not such Americans that the reasons for that no longer exist. But I guess I wonder whether here, There is a normative case on the other side to which you give slightly short shrift, that both in terms of what actually made the union possible, that was a concession that was required to get small states on board, and that we see in other federal polities around the world that these counter-majoritarian concessions to the smaller units are, are just part and parcel of what happens, and that there the argument is perhaps more strongly, look, this incentivizes both parties to be able to play in a broad expanse of a country. And perhaps the remedy here is for them to go and play by these rules rather than to complain about the rules. What do you think to that challenge? Two points. I agree with you that there is a function to be played by these upper chambers, especially in federal systems. But if one looks around the world, I mean, a couple of things. Number one, most unitary systems, that is non-federal systems, a lot of them have eliminated these bodies altogether. So they were kind of upper chambers representing aristocratic elites. They've been eliminated. Places where they continue to be robust are, you're right, federal systems. Let's say take the German Bundesrat, which is the German federal system, the second chamber representing states. The difference between the German system and the American system is instructive. I mean, the Germans actually, after 1945, considered adopting a Senate model. You know, with American troops on the ground, with watchful eyes of Americans overlooking them, they considered it and didn't adopt it. Instead, what they adopted is a more proportional system. So that is, larger states get more votes than smaller states. It's not perfectly proportional. So small states are, in some sense, still overrepresented. So they address the concern that you mentioned. Hamburg gets, you know, representation, you know, the small Saarland, these small, tiny states in Germany get get overrepresented. But the overrepresentation is not so as extreme as it is in the United States. So, you know, there's political scientists have measured how disproportional systems are based on the amount of representatives each state gets and the population. And the U.S. is the most malapportioned Senate in the world, with the exception of Argentina and Brazil. So you combine that with all of our institutions, and it's just one more example of where we are way on the outer edge of where other countries are in the world. And just as a second point, I think you're absolutely right that this was a compromise, both not only over slavery at the founding and the Constitutional Convention, but also between small states and big states. But, you know, George Washington himself, you know, two months after the convention, wrote in a letter, you know, this is an imperfect document. We, the founders, don't have a monopoly on virtue and wisdom. It's up to future generations to improve this document. And so it's true that there was a compromise struck, but, you know, that was a long time ago and it's worth revisiting. You know, the plausibility of whether or not you could ever actually get Senate reform is another question, but I think the normative case for it anyway is pretty strong. If you look comparatively at this question of original pacts and whether it's worth keeping intact the elements of the original pact, most of the most prominent or well-known or certainly well-studied 
pacted transitions to democracy, whether it's South Africa or Chile or in a particular extreme case, Poland, had elements, highly counter-majoritarian and even undemocratic elements, initially built in. But either they were designed to be removed after an election or two, like in South Africa, or they fell by the wayside within a decade or two, obviously having quickly in Poland, a little more slowly in Chile. But there's not much of a theoretical argument to be made for maintaining institutions that emerge out of a pact, particularly over time, indefinitely, particularly as social, economic, political conditions change. And as you noted earlier, Yasha, I think you understated the case. Among the many, many issues that divide Americans, religion, ideology, partisanship, race, state identities almost never come up, right? Never. It was a big deal in 1787, being from Delaware and the interests of the state of Delaware were perceived to be very important because these were basically proto-states. These were pseudo-independent states. So in many ways, comparable to Liechtenstein in the European Union today. But that has changed dramatically, changed very quickly in the United States. And by the 19th century, this was no longer the case, and certainly is no longer the case today. So I think the argument for organizing the Senate around states rather than people is just much, much weaker. I just want to repeat the point, though, just because I'm afraid it'll get lost, is we're not calling for the elimination of the Senate. We're not calling for perfectly proportional Senate. I mean, you know, again, take take the example of Germany, where, you know, Bavaria is a big state, gets five representatives or something. Zarland, with a much, much, much smaller population, gets two representatives. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's tilted in favor of the small states. I think that's fine. But in principle, you know, it's like, let's just make it a little more proportioned. I think that would ascribe a little bit more to kind of basic democratic principles. And it's really hard to imagine an argument against that. I think Steve is right. The states don't matter as much. But, you know, for those who do think states matter, you know, in any federal system, this is justifiable to represent states. But as population has changed, the system has become, and partly again, because we have such an old pre-democratic constitution, it's just worth re-looking at that, at that kind of thing. Now, again, you know, I've come back to the point, this is not at the top of the agenda of things that are going to happen. But I think one of the points that we want to make, I think, is that we're not only advocating for, you know, constitutional institutional changes, we're also advocating for rethinking, thinking anew about our constitution and realizing that, you know, this is a document that can be changed. I mean, that was by design. The founders encouraged us to do this. This is not the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, Jefferson warned us about treating it that way. And so to get these ideas onto the uh, part of the public agenda and public discourse, that's really the most important thing. And so, you know, we want to talk to people about why this is necessary. And we hope that other people talk to other people about why these kinds of reforms are necessary. And if that begins to happen, I think that would be a healthy development for our democracy. So we spent a lot of a conversation going back and forth, you know, in ways that hopefully are interesting to listeners on the fine points of what caused this crisis and how to get out of it. Perhaps we can close the conversation with a little bit of an optimistic vision. I mean, if your account gains traction and we somehow manage to, you know, 25 years from now say, well, thank God we were able to get out of this crisis and institutional reform was a big part of that. What does that story look like? What's going to happen over the next 25 years to take us down that sunny optimistic path. Give us a little bit of hope at the end of this conversation. I think one point that we've already mentioned before, I mean, this may be counterintuitive, but you know, what we really want is a day to come when the Republican Party can win power by winning the majority of the vote for the presidency, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. And, you know, even if you're a Democrat, big D Democrat, one should encourage that and hope for that day to come. Because if that day were to come, we'd have two parties fighting, fighting over votes, trying to win fair and square. And parties would be not trying to suppress the vote, not trying to overturn elections. Parties would be fighting over things like climate change, gun control, immigration. You know, these are all legitimate issues of public disagreement. A democracy requires public disagreement, requires competition, but we can't have any of that as long as we're in the situation that we're in. So the day that that comes, I think that'll be one sign of success. Just very briefly, obviously, at least some of the constitutional changes, if not most of the constitutional changes that we are calling for are difficult. Among democratic constitutions, the U.S. Constitution is the hardest in the world to amend. Unfortunately, we can't count on institutional reform. I think our view is that the institutional reforms that we're calling for 
are inherently good for democracy over the long run, no matter what, getting to a world in which electoral majorities have a greater capacity to win and govern is better than what we've got. I think institutional reform will facilitate, will speed up the transition to a more consolidated multiracial democracy. But institutional reform or not, I am actually relatively optimistic, as you are, Yasha, in the medium term that we'll get there. I think we're in the middle of a really difficult moment. That moment is probably going to persist. Very difficult to tell how long, but it's going to be with us for a while. We're headed for some rocky years. But I think looking in particular at generational change and at the attitudes of younger generations, my expectation is eventually we are actually in this country. Our institutions are strong enough, design aside, they're strong enough that we'll probably ride out this crisis and come out the other side as one of the world's most interesting multiracial democracies. Dan and Steve, thank you for participating in this lively conversation and thank you for your book, The Tyranny of a Minority. Thank you, Yashan. Thank you.